a special event with Danielle McLaughlin. My name is Edel Coffey and it is such a privilege to be here in person with real people for the first time in over a year. Um, this event is going to run for just under an hour and we'll have some readings from Danielle and Sarah and then we'll have a conversation and then you'll be able to ask questions at at the end. But if you can enter your questions in the comments section, you can do it all throughout our conversation and the questions will be fed through at the very end. So um, a little bit about our authors. Uh, Sarah Moss is the author of seven novels, including Summer Water and Ghost Wall, which was a nominee for the Women's Prize for Fiction. Her previous books include novels Cold Earth, Night Walking, Bodies of Light and Signs for Lost Children, along with the memoir Names for the Sea, Strangers in Iceland. She was educated at the University of Oxford and now teaches at University College Dublin. Summer Water, her latest novel, tells the story of six families cooped up in their Scottish holiday cabins, watching each other whilst taking refuge from an endless day of rain. Danielle McLaughlin is the author of The Art of Falling. Her debut collection of short stories, Dinosaurs on Other Planets, was published in 2015. She won the Sunday Times Audible Short Story Award in 2019 and was awarded a Wyndham Campbell Prize for Fiction. Her stories have appeared in The New Yorker and The Stinging Fly, amongst others. The Art of Falling is her debut novel, and it tells the story of Nessa, a 40-something woman whose marriage and career are falling apart, while her teenage daughter is growing up and pulling away from her. It's so nice to speak to you both, and thank you for joining us this evening. We're going to start with readings from both of you. Danielle, you're going to go first. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the section you're going to read first, please? Yes, yeah, so... The section I'm going to read is when Nessa goes to visit the Locks house in West Cork. And we're going to see her in the studio of the late sculptor Robert Locke, where one of the main pieces of sculpture that features in the novel, the chalk sculpture, is, is in, in that studio. It was humid dull, save for a dazzle of light miles out at sea, and Tanessa hadn't worn any tights. She noticed that her legs, pale and dappled here and there with old bruises, complemented the floorboards. She'd already measured every inch of this floor on her hands and knees, photographed it, sketched it on gridded paper over a series of afternoons in preparation for the gallery's acquisition of the studio. She'd marked in pencil the exact location of Robert Locke's chair, his workbench still with its rasps and chisels, the cast iron statue, half stoat, half man, that had stood so long in one place that when she'd moved it, she'd found two perfect imprints of its clawed iron feet on the floor. She had liaised with the conservationist, commissioned the survey and the elevational drawings. She had tagged, she had devised a computerized archive. Already some things had been packed into boxes with typed labels on the outside, a catalogue number in the top right hand corner. The chalk sculpture stood in the middle of the room. It had achieved notoriety some years before, when it came to be regarded as embodying fertility powers. The public had sought it out in their hundreds. They came in a spirit of supplication, less to marvel at what critics had described as the piece's gritty transcendence, its alien unsettling beauty, than to plead their case. Nessa walked over and touched a hand to the swell of the figure's belly. The sculpture had once languished for a period in a disused cowshed in Clonakilty, before the farmer, reportedly tired of it, delivered it by tractor and trailer back to the Locke women, Robert Locke being dead by then. Nessa touched a finger to the indent in the centre of the chalk white belly. A groove had formed from the already water damaged gypsum being eroded by the hands of pilgrims. Nessa wondered about these people who'd flocked not to consider Robert Locke's genius but to beg for babies. She had rescued the sculpture from such indignities. But when the gallery had set about acquiring it, parts still had a dungish tinge from the years in the cowshed. The conservationist had spent days with a small brush, engaged in the complicated process of cleaning without erasing. I'll leave it there. 
Thank you, Danielle. Um, Sarah, you're going to read for us now as well. What's the piece you're going to read? I'm going to read from the first section of Summer Water. So this is Justine, who is also a 40-something mother of young children, sneaking out for a run very early in the morning on this very wet day. Both hands to ease the door handle. Stop at the children's door to unravel two sets of breathing. Dither about whether to take the one key leaving them locked in and needing to go through the windows in a fire, the windows being low and easy to open and there being no plausible cause of fire just now, or leave the key, meaning that she can't lock the door and there are three beloved souls sleeping undefended in the woods, or at least two beloved souls and one mostly tolerated one. Fire, she thinks, is more likely than murderous nutters. You do hear of psychopaths hanging out in holiday parks, but only in America. And the good thing about being at the end of a 10-mile single-track road is that the getaway options are crap. Unless, of course, the nutter plans to hide in the woods until dark. But there's not much dark this time of year. Wouldn't the police bring dogs? Or he could swim across the loch, at least if he'd thought to bring a wetsuit. Or she. Women can probably be serial killers too. Wasn't the one in Japan? Though that was life insurance fraud more than sadism, not that it makes much difference to the victims. Though a fraudster probably kills you faster than a sadist, so maybe it does. You'd need to get into the wetsuit before embarking on your murderous games, not something you want to be doing between committing a crime and leaving the scene, even worse than putting on a sports bra. Jesus, look at that rain. There's almost no point putting clothes on for that. If she'd brought her swimming costume, she'd wear it. One thing, it can't keep up like that all day. There can't be that much water up there. She sits on the veranda to fasten her shoes, to adjust her armband and choose her music. She should probably run mindfully here, listening to the wind in the trees and the lapping of the loch, and any birds deranged enough to attempt flight in the deluge. But fuck that, she needs music for her feet, music to connect her feet to the ground so she doesn't have to think about it. It's not, she sees, even half five yet, she can have two hours if she wants them, get in a quick 20k. Though if she does that, she'll be eating all day and the kids wanting a snack every time they see her. But she knows she's going to do it anyway. She's got four peanut protein bars tucked into her packet of sanitary towels in the suitcase, the only place no one else is likely to look. And she's not too proud to eat them in the bathroom if she has to. And off, feet pattering, heart and lungs surprised, labouring. Cold water on bed warm skin. And why is she doing this again, exactly? The holiday park is asleep. Curtains drawn, cars beaded with rain. The log cabins, she thinks again, are a stupid idea. Borrowed from America, or maybe Scandinavia. But anyway, somewhere it rains less than Scotland. When did you see wooden buildings anywhere in Britain? Turf more like up here. Stone if you've got it. Won't rot. One thing to rent one for a couple of weeks, even if obviously the wrong couple of weeks weather-wise. But even if you had the means, wouldn't it be an admission of defeat to buy one? You've only to look at the woodwork to see their depreciating assets anyway. If you've got money, you might as well spend it on visas and plane tickets and not pass what are supposed to be the best weeks of the year watching a loch fill with rain. She must check the bank balance next time there's internet. Steve was right, she'll admit that. Camping would have been a mistake. But they're not cheap, these chalets, not in the holidays. She'll be needing to buy new uniforms for the boys when they get back. Noah's ankles poking out of his trousers weeks before the end of last term. And isn't the car needing its MOT before the end of the month? They can always just not drive it for a couple of weeks till the salaries come in. Done that before, her on her bike, steal the bus. It's a luxury anyway, really, the car. They should maybe sell it while it's still worth something. She leaps a puddle, feels a cold muscle stretch. She could do anything this hour of the morning. Steal laundry sagging from racks on a couple of verandas. Nick a boat from the pontoon and go explore the islands. Set fire to one of these stupid big cars that will be dry enough underneath. But she won't, because she's running now. You don't stop once you've started. Not even to set fire to things that need burning down. Thank you so much, both of you. They were great readings. Um, and perhaps it might be a good place to start talking about what both covered there. Um, which is not necessarily what the books are about, but so much detail in the book is about um, marriage, domesticity, motherhood, and I suppose they are inextricable really from uh, many people's lives. And I, I love the detail. Um, 
what we just heard there, Justine running and thinking of her husband, thinking of her children. Did you want to explore that sort of, I suppose we've all become so familiar with it over the last year, so close to our families and our partners if we have them. Did you want to look at that sort of granular detail of of knowing somebody so well and becoming so familiar with them that um, the other side of love is maybe tolerance? <laughs> At best. <laughs> yes, I was thinking about, particularly about points of view and I wanted to have different people speaking from the same scene so that you think you know the situation, but then you hear the other side of it and you realise that you didn't know it. And also so that the reader would come to know more about what's going on than any one of the characters does and to be able to see what the characters don't know. Um, so hence the interest in everybody looking through windows and watching each other and making up stories. Yeah, that um, mosaic kind of structure is, it's very interesting to read. And also there's so many different aspects because you've got lots of different generations. Um, when you were writing from all those points of view, was it as uh, tricky as I imagine it might be? Because it it doesn't get confusing for the reader. They're all differentiated very clearly, but I imagine it was uh, quite the feat. I left a few days between each voice because I knew that if I if I ever tried to write the end of one and then the beginning of ne the next in the same day or even probably three or four days, it would have been much harder to kind of leave and step back in again. Mm -hmm. But they seemed quite distinctive to me. They were they they came quite clearly as different. Danielle, talk to me a little bit about your main character Nessa and the story that is the backdrop against which she. Um, she is set essentially because we've got her sort of personal domestic story um and then we've got the story of robert locke the artist tell me a little bit about both of those stories for people who haven't read the book and how they sort of connect so nessa's marriage is coming back together after her husband's affair and she's also feeling quite positive about a new work project that she's involved in a retrospective art exhibition on the work of a deceased sculptor, Robert Locke. And then her past comes back into her present at the worst possible time. The idea of looking at her domestic crisis and also her work crisis and then bringing them together was partly because I wanted to put her under pressure on a number of different fronts at the same time because I wanted to see how she might react under pressure because I think that's when people get even more interesting. I think when problems arrive neatly one at a time and we can put away one before we move on to the next Wouldn't one, it, so it's nice. simpler. <laughs> so I wanted this messy tangle, if you like, to, to happen for Nessa. And I did want the two sides of her life to end up weaving together. I think that's something that tends to happen a lot. Anyway, I'm from Cork. The story is set in Cork. I think, you know, you, you can't avoid people. If you try, really, you, you're going to keep meeting people and paths are going to keep crossing. And I was interested in having the two different sets of pressure converge for her. That's interesting what you say about, you know, you're going to meet people and paths keep crossing, um, particularly in, in smaller communities. Um, and that was one of the things that was really, it was quite, it made me sort of cringe so much when I read about, um, because he has an affair with um, a neighbor. And this, we find this out very early in the book, so I'm not spoiling to say that. Um, but, you know, Nessa has to deal with that kind of uh, public knowledge of what he's done. And she has to go to the school knowing that other people know. And she has to see the woman he's had an affair with, um, which is very difficult. But um, that sense of, of living in that kind of community and not being able to get away from it. Did you want to explore that a little bit? I was interested in the difference or the gap that's there between how people present and how people actually are feeling mm. in the inside. So I think Nessa is someone who is very conscious of how she is seen by other people. And I think she's very aware of how she should behave um, 
but at the same time she has a lot of turmoil going going on inside so yeah um again i think it was just interesting to make for me to make it um, a little bit difficult for her by having it be a neighbor that her husband had the affair with and in fact Nessa's daughter and the other woman's daughter were best friends so that that was particularly tricky that's great so she had her in the house all the time <laughs> um Sarah, you deal with community as well in your book. Um, you've got this setting, you've got all of these strangers in these six cabins and they're all watching each other, as you say. And it's a, a sort of enforced community because, you know, they'll go back to their own lives after two weeks or a week and they'll never see each other again. Um, but yet they do have to kind of deal with each other to a certain extent. D did you want to explore that kind of thing? You know, if you are living side by side with somebody, you have to engage or at least attempt to in a way. Yes, I did. I was thinking about neighbours and about people forced into proximity. I was thinking when Danielle was talking about Cork and people meeting each other again, that this is this is a very different kind of coming together because, as you say, they won't meet each other again and no choices have been made the only things that these people have in common is their choice of holiday and they're all wondering why they chose that <laughs> holiday anyway. Um, so... I mean, like Danielle, and perhaps this is just how novels work, I was interested in what happens when you put people under pressure in a situation. And the obvious pressure here is that it's been raining for two weeks. Um, it's going to go on raining for the foreseeable future and isolation. But the other pressure is how, how a makeshift community can be formed among people who are watching each other and judging each other and think they have very little in common, although in fact, demographically, they have a huge amount in common, but they're much more interested in their differences and their similarities. Mm. Uh, which brings me to the Brexit question. Uh, it, it has been called a Brexit book. Do you feel it's a Brexit book? Were you thinking of that when you were writing it? I couldn't not have been thinking about it when I was writing it because I was living in England in 2018, 2019, and you know, that's what we were thinking about. <sighs> I don't think it's a Brexit book in that it's a book about Britain leaving the European Union. I think it's a Brexit book in that it's interested in the divisiveness of certain kinds of national identity. And it's interested in what might be left after we've decided that we're all different and irreconcilable and we have nothing to say to each other and half of the country hates the other half of the country. You know, what is there enough community left to respond in an emergency? And of course, that's a question that's been quite present with us over the last 14 months. Yeah. Um, Danielle, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit, a bit about the, um, the genesis of this novel, because people will know you so well from your short stories. Um, they won really prestigious prizes, obviously. And this book was, it, was it a long time in the writing or was it a long time coming? How did you make the transition from short stories to novels? Well, it was definitely a very long time in the writing because I can remember specifically it was in 2012 at Waterford Writers Weekend when I did a workshop with Noel O'Connor that the spark for um, for the novel and in particular the spark for the piece of sculpture, the chalk sculpture, came to light during that novel. So that was 2012. And for a long time, I thought it was a short story. So I was writing short stories called the chalk sculpture in a whole different, um, a whole range of them from different perspectives for maybe about two years. And then in 2014, I went to Kilreely Gartis' retreat, and it was while I was there that I realized that some characters that I was working on and I thought believed, that I believed belonged in a novel, that they actually went with the chalk sculpture short story. And once I put those two things together, it just, it just got its own momentum after that, and the, the novel came together. Fantastic. Um, I was reading Patricia Highsmith's book recently, actually, on plotting, and she was saying that often her idea for something only really took flight when she realized another idea over here would go perfectly with that, almost like a verse at a chorus in a way. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned that. Um, you talk about art, obviously, a lot in this book, and I wanted to talk to you both about 
art and craft and, you know, your art writing, and then also the sort of underlying creative process, which is the craft of it. And I know that Sarah, you've referred to writing as um, a serious form of play. And I love that in Danielle's novel, we have two female artists who um, are not as um, successful commercially or whatever you want to call it as the, the male artist. And yet they have the impulse and the urge to create and to be artists because that's what they are. And I wonder, is that impulse there for, for both of you? It, do, do you kind of enjoy it in, in that kind of like craft way as well as, you know, creating your novels? Does that make sense? Um, I think so. I suppose for me, I came to writing quite late and mm. it's a second career and I practiced law for a long time. So I would never really have seen myself as being part of the art world. So in a way, it um, it gave me an opportunity to, to look at that world maybe from the edges and I've always really admired people who can do visual art, who can make sculpture. I've always liked to wander into galleries and museums and look at them without having any talent to, to do that myself, you know, but I have liked, I've been drawn to them. So I did enjoy the opportunity to actually create pieces of sculpture to put on a page because I had to think of a body of work that my fictional sculptor might have made and I had to think about what might have influenced him so it was fun yeah that that was good fun um that part of it especially um making sculpture without without making sculpture yeah I, I've uh, I've recently come to find very little joy in writing but that's to do with me but Sarah do you get that sense of joy from writing as you mentioned that that sense of play even if it's a serious sense of play yes Yes, and increasingly so, I think I'm, I feel as if I'm becoming a slightly wilder writer with each book that I, I used to be much more serious and less playful. Mm -hmm. um, but I too really love to spend time in museums and art galleries and miss them terribly this last year. I think most of my novels have had a point of origin in a museum or a gallery. They're one of very few spaces where we go just to look at things and not to make a noise and actually make anything ourselves either, where, where we're just there to to absorb and to be influenced and to be open to things. Mm -hmm. And that, that's been hugely important to my creative process. And uh, people, I'm sure, will be aware that you're an academic as well, you uh, um, in UCD. Does that side of your... Um, of your brain come into writing novels? I presume that side of research comes into writing your novels. Yes, though, again, probably less so as I, I progress through my career. Um, my first novel, I took great pleasure in thanking the Arts and Humanities Research Board for funding the research. They didn't know that was what they were doing. They thought they were funding my PhD. Uh, but I found a second use for a lot of that work. As I've gone on, I think my work's become less research-based. But... I think the kind of pattern spotting that you do as a novelist is not unlike the kind of pattern spotting that you can do as a researcher. It's an intuition for what might be there. But as a novelist, you're interested in what's missing from the record, where the gaps and the silences are. And as a researcher, you're interested in mapping what's there. But they're quite similar skills. And I do love teaching. I mean, that, you know, that's that's the other string to my bow. I definitely want to talk to you a bit about creative writing a little bit later on as well and the, the teaching process. But I did want to ask you both about um, the, the subject of sex in your novels because uh, there's there's some really comic moments in yours, Sarah. Um, and Danielle, you, you deal with sex as a sort of central plot in, in the novel with the affair, but also with, um, as you mentioned, Nessa's past as well. Um, when you were writing about the, the female characters, um, were, were you aware of trying to present um, what I would describe as maybe a more authentic or a, a real sort of aspect of, of male sexuality, which is not always what it's sometimes presented as? I think, um, I think I let Nessa be herself on the page and she's quite messy and she's a bit complicated and contradictory I think at times I think she has during her lifetime made some 
very bad decisions around sex. And depending on what view a reader takes of some of the decisions she makes as a 40 something, maybe she's not making great decisions now either. But I think she's human. So I thought, yes, she's, you know, she's human. That means she has made lots of mistakes and she's doing her best to survive them, I think. So I I wasn't going to punish her for anything and I wasn't going to, you know, reward her or hand out medals to her either. But I, I was interested in in watching her as she as she survived and got on with things. I was interested at one point, there was a comment that her husband makes um, about uh, her past and saying that um, it's, it's essentially a shaming comment where he says, I would never, I would never t- tell our daughter that. Um, and I wondered where you're trying to make a point there about the double standard between men and women when it comes to sex and sexual behavior. Um, I think double standards come to the fore quite a bit over the course of the novel. Um, It wasn't that I set out to make that point, but I just felt that was exactly what, it was exactly the approach that he would take to her at that point. And I think shame is at the root of it. Um, And I think of all the characters um, in the novel, many of them are, I think, damaged by shame and guilt. But actually, um, you know, Philip, her, her husband, doesn't seem too bothered at all about his behavior, but he is happy to um, to dish out comments of that I'm sort thinking. to Tanessa. I was, to I was very enraged reading that particular line. I was like, Philip, now you need to just hold it there a little bit. Um, I do want to talk to you about this most wonderful chapter in your book called Zanzibar, which is, um, well, when you describe it, will you? Because I'm sure you'll do it much better than I will. I think you just want me to say the rude words. I, do, I honestly don't. I love saying rude words. <laughs> <laughs> um, Zanzibar is told from the point of view of Millie, who is a, a young woman. She's in her 20s, um, newly engaged to her boyfriend, Josh, whose parents own one of these kind of decrepit damp cabins and have kindly given them the keys for a couple of weeks and they're doing what a newly engaged couple might do when it's raining very hard and there's nowhere to go and nothing to do and you're locked in a cabin together I was interested in the same way that I'm interested in following Justine's narrative when she's running or you know a teenage boy's narrative when he's kayaking I'm interested in the relationship between what our bodies are doing and what the words in our heads might be and I didn't think I'd ever read a sex scene about what somebody's thinking about during sex rather than what they're actually doing with their bodies and I thought that might be quite fun and it was. And why did you choose to um, have her think what she was thinking because it's different than well do you know what I think a lot of us could probably relate to it at some point or other in our lives. (laughs) (laughs) We get distracted we have our lists you know, we were, she's she at one point she's thinking that she really it's really hungry. She just wants to eat her her rasher sandwich or her bath. Yeah, she's slightly bored. She yeah. doesn't really want to be there, and she needs to move on with her day. Um, I was thinking about about what it's like to be trying to do something with your body um, and I'm thinking about that a lot in this book I mean the, the, you know, there's a, an older woman who's in the early stages of dementia and is trying to do things that she can't do anymore and there's a teenage boy who's trying to see how far he can take his kayak in rough weather and there's Justine running when her body's not really doing all that well with it so I was interested in what a person has to do in their head to to have an orgasm you know what what do you have to do to what stories do you have to tell yourself and what other stories might be competing in your mind and how do you stop thinking about daily life and think about the thing that's going to make this happen um, yeah and I'm not going to spoil it for anybody by revealing why the, t- the title of the chapter is Zanzibar <laughs> it's, it's so pleasurable to find out um why that's there um Danielle I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, the art in this book. And you, you've mentioned there that you had such an enjoyable time creating the art, but you've also created um, what we've de- I've described before as an art monster in Robert Locke, because he is that um, archetypal kind of uh, artist who, almost like Nabokov, you know, he didn't even fold his own umbrella, as we know, that kind of man who was so single-minded about being an artist that everything else 
had to suffer, I suppose. Um, and then you've got your two female characters who are actually artists as well, but didn't pursue it in the same way. Um, what did you want to say about, you know, the artist type and then that sort of lesser artist type that maybe doesn't pursue it in because they've got other other responsibilities maybe or they don't they don't pursue it so single mindedly i think that the way the art world was structured and maybe the way society was structured allowed robert Locke to to be that art monster and it allowed him to abuse power in relationships and it allowed him um, to be a person who was lacking, I think, often in integrity, but he was making good art. And I suppose maybe I was thinking about the difference between art and the making of art, and then all the different structures that grow up around art. Um, so there's the art, and then there's all the structures, the business structures, um, the corporate side of art, the making of money. And I think the art world that Robert Locke um, inhabited rewarded him and didn't question him. and didn't ask anything from him other than to produce his art, whereas I think the women artists in the novel found themselves expected to do so many other things and being doubted a lot more. And I think one of the things that I found myself coming back to again and again the novel just I found myself being drawn to it was the idea of why do we believe and respect some people and not others you know so what what leads us to choose to follow one story one version and not another so I think um, the way things were structured the way the art world was structured the way society was structured the system of rewards um that all facilitated Robert Locke to be an art monster, but it was much harder, I think, um, for the women artists to, to pursue their art. And also, I think Robert was very ego-driven in some ways, so he was, it was really important to him to, to get that kind of external um, recognition and validation, whereas perhaps... Um, Perhaps women were more focused on the on the making of of the art and for for the art itself. As two incredibly successful writers, tell me about the ego. Is how much how much is it involved, and are we even allowed to say? <laughs> I don't know why you're both looking at me. Go, go um, on, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Something I say to students, and that I think can be learnt is that if you can separate your ego from your work you'll have a much nicer time um and I think that's that's true and it's not easy but I'm a writer I'm a very messy inefficient writer I delete a lot I ditch a lot I quite often write most of a book and then decide that it's not working and I don't like it and it won't do and I don't find that uncomfortable which is either because I'm so profoundly committed to my own ego that it you know it's invincible um or because I don't feel that I exist in what I've written. The, the words feel separate from my private personality. So I don't feel as if I'm hurting myself when I delete things that I've written. And I think a lot of people do, and I think particularly new writers tend to, because you, you've put yourself into it, and therefore if you take something out, it feels as if you're taking yourself out. But I think if you can, if you can possibly think that what you've made is separate from who you are, the whole business becomes much more comfortable. Have you always felt that way? As in, you've always had separateness between what you write and yourself? It's probably come with time and experience, but I think also the training of academia is quite useful. I mean, early in my publishing career, my editors would sometimes you know, approach me very carefully to tell me that perhaps I really should just think again a little bit about chapter three and that was so much gentler than the things that academics say to each other and the way it works in academic oh. publishing it was fine you know I've, I've heard far worse than that just tell me what the problem is and I'll deal with it um so there's there's probably some of that 
Danielle, do you want to address the question of the ego as somebody who came to writing maybe through a different path than a lot of writers, which is they are born, they decide they want to write a novel and they will not rest until they've done it. Um, was the ego apparent early on in your writing or did it has it come out um, only through publication? Well, I would very much like to get to that point, what that Sarah is talking about, for it, to separate the self from the work, to separate the ego from the work, because I think that that would make things so much easier. But at the moment, I find myself getting very bound up um, with the work, which means that I'm often very hard on myself, I think, because if I look at the work and something hasn't reached the standard that I wanted it to be, well, then I tend to get very cross with myself rather than saying, well, you know, this is just something I need to to rewrite. Does that happen often? Do you find that the writing falls short of um, the goal or the imagined goal? Oh, yes. All, all the time, you know, constantly. Um, I suppose it always should, should it? I think that's what makes it interesting. And I don't think I, I don't think anybody would want to do it if it were easy, actually. And that's partly what I mean by playfulness, that I'm interested in finding the limits of what I can do on that particular occasion with that particular idea. And you only find the limits by overreaching them and having it go wrong. Sarah, I, I do want to talk to you about um, your role uh, in the creative writing department in, in UCD, because I'm aware that we will be opening up to a viewer's questions in a few minutes. But um, ca can you talk to us a little bit about that role and um, maybe a little bit about creative writing itself? Y you believe, obviously, that you can teach it. I find the idea that you wouldn't be able to teach it a little strange. I mean, nobody thinks that you can't teach music or you can't teach dance or even that you can't teach painting. So why writing should be unique among the art forms in being unteachable is not clear to me. And nobody's ever been able to explain to me why that should be. I think like any other art form, if you're going to do it professionally, you need talent and training. But I think that model of inspiration simply comes to you and you in your solitary glory write it down and there is a masterpiece is very suspect and very culturally specific as well. You can't make a great writer out of somebody who's not a great writer, but you can help somebody who is a great writer to find what they can do and most importantly to learn how they can challenge themselves. Why do you think it is that that is the one art form that we expect people to just be... Um, completely ready-made uh, as artists and they don't have to train, they don't have to um, take any classes in it. I think it's a legacy of romanticism. I mean, I don't think that taking creative writing classes is the only way to learn to write. I certainly never took one and none of my generation did because they didn't exist. So I'm not saying that you need, you need to train as a writer, but I think that if you're interested in literature, reading and writing, then taking some classes and joining a workshop is a, a very respectable and useful way to to focus on your development. Danielle, have you ever done writing classes or workshops or anything like that? Oh, yes. It was actually one of the milestones of my development in writing was when I discovered that writing could be taught. And I totally agreed that writing can be taught because I was taught how to write. And that was like, wow, a revelation. Because I think up to then I had this idea that if I was a real writer, I would just write it and there it would come out right on the page. And if I wrote something and it seemed awful, well, then I probably wasn't a real writer. But I did workshops at the Monster Literature Centre and I discovered that there are things about writing that can be taught and you just have to practice them and put the time in. And when I realised that once you're prepared to put the time in, that you can eventually make something that, you know, might actually be published somewhere, that was, well, it was... In one way, it was slightly depressing because it takes so much time. But on the other hand, there was the realization that, yes, if you stick with it and put in the time and practice and, you know, just put into effect what, what you've been taught, that you can actually make something that works. And at workshops, I at those workshops, I met the women who are now my writing group. And that was 
10 years ago now and we still meet, we try and meet twice a month and we use the same method that we were taught about critiquing work back in those first workshops. So, Can you tell us about that method? Oh, yeah, well, um, very briefly, we exchange the work in advance by email and then everyone prepares written notes on everyone else's piece. And then before COVID, we used to meet up in person um, and have an in-person meeting. Now we do it over Zoom, but we would then discuss all the pieces and we would be very kind and very honest as well. And at the end of the evening, everyone has had not just the discussion, but a whole set of written notes mm. on their piece to take away then and look at, you know, and in, in quiet and peace and decide what they're going to, to keep and what might have to go. And I think I find it so useful having a number of different viewpoints because, you know, if if three people are all saying that they had no idea what I was doing in that paragraph, well, then I really do need to go back mm. and, you know, face the fact that I have to look again at that paragraph. Mm. It's essential, really, isn't it, to have eyes on it like that? It is, and I don't think it's a novelty either. I mean, Wordsworth was having Dorothy and Mary and Coleridge read his work as he was writing it and critique it mm -hmm. and feed it back to him. Austin had her sister and people that she was writing to. The Brontes had each other. You know, this idea of the solitary genius is, has no historical basis. Um, well, I think we're just going to open up to um, questions. But um, before we do, I just wanted to say that you have another novel coming out, don't you? Lockdown-based mm. novel? Yeah, it's the one everyone says you shouldn't write, so we'll find well, out. Well, you've already written it, yes. so <laughs> too late. Um, it's called Fe The Fell? The Fell, okay, yes. And when will it be out next year? November. November. Amazing. You put us all to shame. Um, Sarah Moss and Danielle McLaughlin, thank you for such insightful answers. And we will open up now to um, viewers' questions. Uh, Ruth has some here for us now, I think. I do indeed, yeah. So I have a question here for Sarah from Damien. He says, your work often features characters with some very close-minded views. How do you feel about inhabiting those personas? Mm, that's a really interesting question. It's I often frighten myself because it's actually quite easy. And I think once you've understood that that people do genuinely feel what they feel. I was thinking about this the other day. I was running along the seafront past the 40 foot and somebody scrawled hoax across one of the COVID notices. And I was just thinking, it must be so frightening if you actually believe it's a hoax. I mean, of course, it's not a hoax and I wouldn't for a minute imagine that it was. But if you seriously believe that world governments are in league to to shut people up under lockdown and there's no disease and no real danger. That must be an absolutely terrifying position. And I said this to one of my friends who said, no, what's terrifying is that you're thinking like that. I said, well, yes, but if you don't understand why people think what they think, then you won't be able to change it. So yes, it can be alarming and I can alarm myself by being able to understand positions I don't hold, but it's also probably quite useful. <laughs> That's great, thank you. And we have a question for Danielle from Thomas. He says, how does it feel to approach a novel as opposed to a short story? Okay, so there were some parts of writing the novel that were much more difficult because I had to get used to working with a much bigger piece of material because with the short story, it's a much smaller piece of material. So it's like I'm doing little embroidery with the short story, but I really have to keep all the different bits of material, a whole roll of it um, together for the novel. Um, I also found that with the novel, I had a space of maybe about six weeks when a few different elements of the plot and the characters just came together for me. And then I had a really exhilarating six weeks of writing, 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 and there was a real rush to it. And that was something that I hadn't ever experienced with, with a short story. So that was a really new and, yeah, really, really cool thing about writing the novel. Thank you. That's really interesting. And another question here for Sarah. It says, how do you come up with such potent senses of foreboding in your novels? Um, by not thinking about it. It's I'm, I sort of think at the beginning that it needs to be there, but 
I've never conducted an orchestra, but I sometimes think it might be a little bit like that, where there's a low note that you're just bringing up gradually through the novel towards the end. But I have to do it by not looking at it and just, just let that happen. Otherwise, it would feel very contrived. Of course, thank you. And another question here from Kean in Dublin. He says, and this is to both of you, how has your writing been affected by lockdown, if it has at all? Okay. Um, badly. I mean, for me, lockdown and emigrating from England to Ireland happened kind of on top of each other. So it's a little bit hard to tell. I stopped writing entirely for a few months, though my son very kindly at one point said, mum, you haven't stopped writing because it's an artistic crisis. And I will say I had never claimed it was any such thing. I hadn't mentioned it. You're just so obsessed by trying to move house that you're reading the property specifications instead of thinking about your book, which was true. Um, but happily, we bought a house and that ended. I then, I mean, I wrote this little novel about lockdown, despite everybody saying that you shouldn't write a lockdown novel and it would take at least 15 years for anybody to be able to write about COVID. But I was very interested in the experiences of isolation. And I think I'm still thinking about community in the same way that I'm thinking about community in Summer Water and in a different way in Ghost Wall and community under strain and the relationship between individuals and communities. So yeah, in the end, I wrote about it. Danielle? Yeah, I think when the first lockdown started, I was actually thinking, I'm going to be fine, you know, and I'm going to cope really well being um, away from the world. And I thought I would get loads of writing done as well because I thought I wasn't going to be affected by lockdown because I'm much an introvert. But the longer it went on, I found that actually... It, it really did get to me and my my anxiety um, levels just skyrocketed so it it became quite difficult to to produce work um I've been trying to get back into new writing routines partly because this, you know the places where I used to go to write like cafes are out now and the desk where I would do my computer-based work became for a long time everybody's desk because there were so many people working from home and studying from home so I've kind of been trying to get into new routines to help me um, get back to producing more writing and at the moment my new writing routine is staying in bed in the morning and writing in bed so so far I'm I'm recommending that one that sounds like a fabulous writing regime uh, have are you working on anything that you'd like to talk about are you doing more short stories are you working on a novel I'm working on an, another novel. It's um, very rough at this stage. I'm showing it to my writing group, but I haven't shown it to anybody else. I was fortunate that just before the first lockdown happened, I got away to Kilreelig again, which is always a place that, that I find very inspirational. So I got a good chunk of work done there. So at least I had that um, before lockdowns started in. Um, so I'm working on um, rewrites of that new novel and I'm always writing short stories as well. So I have a few of them at various stages of construction that I'll hopefully be getting finished. Wonderful. That's great. Thank you so much. And I have a lovely question here from Mary in Cork. She says, a theme of the festival is that we as readers use books and art to make sense of the world. Do you use your writing to process the events happening around the world? And that's to, to both of you. Not consciously, but I think, yes, certainly. And I think we probably all do because we are in our time and place and part of our time and place and shaped by it. So, so yes. And it, actually I started writing again after I read the winter papers, because that was the first time that I'd read published literature that was beginning to think about the pandemic. And that was really a watershed for me. The idea that this wasn't just a horrible thing that had no stories and that was overwhelming us, but something that it was possible to write about and to make art about. And I think that was really my turning point with it because I, I too found lockdown extraordinarily hard. I mean, you shouldn't because I'm used to working on my own and I'm used to being in a room on my own. And, but yeah, I discovered my inner extrovert very quickly. 
Danielle, do you use your writing to make sense of the world? Um, again, not consciously, but all the things that are going on in the world, they they seep in and they tend to affect my characters and the way that they affect me. And every so often my character will a character will say something or come up with a thought or come up up against a situation that they have to make a choice about. And then I find myself, you know, teasing things out and trying to think it through. So I don't consciously set out to try and make sense of the world. But um, there's no doubt that I I learn things from the novel and from the characters as, as I'm writing. That's great. Thank you. And another question here we have from Philip in Clare. And he says, did you develop any lockdown hobbies in relation to writing or otherwise? Sarah. Um, in relation to writing, I've started taking my work to parks and beaches because I, I like writing in cafes and libraries. And I used to get huge amounts of work done on trains when I was traveling for events. And I was beginning to feel very trapped in my desk in my house with everybody else in my house trapped at their desk in the house. Um, so that's that's been quite good although quite chilly I did I'm ashamed to say try roller skating um and then I was just too embarrassed to keep doing it so <laughs> that was an expensive and foolish hobby and Danielle you've mentioned that you've got a new writing regime do you yeah. take up any roller skating um no roller skating um my lockdown hobby is much tamer in that I've been doing gardening so I, I like gardening. I think it might be quite an addictive thing, actually. I'm, uh, I find it calming and there's something uplifting about it, I think. Do you find that you figure things out? And maybe, Sarah, you, you're a runner, are you? Mm. So do you find that you work things out to do with your books while you're running or gardening? Does it untangle knots for you? Um, for me, it's not that any answers come to me while I'm gardening, but I think gardening puts me in a less anxious frame of mind. And when that anxiety is taken out of the picture, I think the brain has a chance to sort out other things and other things can bubble up to the surface when the anxiety is, is taken out. So I think um, the gardening helps in that way. How about you, Sarah? Yeah, similarly, I was going to say, I don't... I don't usually consciously think about writing when I'm running, but running does put me in a flow state. I also knit, which I think is just running for your fingers. And it sometimes feels if all of my hobbies are kind of self-soothing. Uh, yeah, and cycling actually is when I have my best ideas. That's great, thank you. And just final question is for Adele. Could you tell us anything about your book? I <laughs> know um, I have yet to figure out my elevator pitch uh, for for my novel. It's coming out next year, and that is such a very kind question. Whoever's asked that one, so thank you. But it's it'll be out next year, and I will have figured out something to say about it by then. <laughs> Caught you off guard there. <laughs> thank you. I'm sorry, um, but yeah, I'm really uh, Sarah and Danielle are going to give me some training in how to answer questions instead of ask them. <laughs> Like it's going to be easier. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Um, but I, I can tell you what it's about, if that's um, any use. It's just, it's about two women, and it's called Breaking Point, and the two women have reached their own kind of individual breaking points. One is a doctor under extreme pressure, and one is a journalist who um, will be covering the trial of the doctor because something happens to the doctor, and it's basically exploring how we're all living under extreme pressure in late stage capitalist society this is why i have to come up with my elevator pitch <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> thank you um that's the final question so thank you everybody for tuning in to hear these two supremely talented writers danielle mclaughlin and sarah uh, moss and if you would like to buy their books this is the books sarah moss summer water and danielle mclaughlin the art of falling they're both available from the festival bookshop at charlieburn.ie Thank you very much. Thank you both so much. Thank you.